Good morning, everyone. I'm Allison Van Dyke. I'm the Executive Director of the Temple of Understanding, and I want to welcome you to the Eco Justice for All dialogue series today. Environmental stewardship, the business perspective. This is a subject that is one of the first subjects that we've had on business, and I'm very, very excited to hear our speakers today. This series is an ongoing project of the Temple of Understanding. We're a 63-year-old interfaith organization whose mission is to advocate for interfaith values in the secular setting of the United Nations as an NGO and around the world. Our focus for the past 12 years has been to increase the awareness of religious leaders and actors of our climate crisis and its negative impact on achieving the UN's sustainable development goals. In particular, we focus on peace, justice, women's health and safety, food sovereignty, and environmental sustainability. It's my pleasure today to welcome our moderator, Holly Elmore. Holly is the founder and CEO of Elemental Impact. Holly, over to you. Well, thank you so much for the high honor of inviting Elemental Impact to orchestrate this um, Eco Justice for All dialogue. Um, it was thrilling to bring together my colleagues and EI advisors. And also I'd like to mention that all of the uh, speakers today are members of Lambda Alpha International, and that is a 90 year old land economics honorary. A little bit about me. Um, I'm a business person who happens to run a national environmental nonprofit. I started my career at Arthur Anderson and Audit. I was then with a huge real estate developer. I was their Southeastern um, controller. And then I was in the restaurant industry and food service for 15 years. And then went into the nonprofit realms when we formed Elemental Impact as the home to the zero waste zones. We were the forerunner in the nation for the commercial collection of food waste for composting. And it was during this era of recycling refinement from inception 2010 to 2017 that I met and worked very closely with our first two panelists, who I'll introduce in a minute. And back in June of 2017, EI segued from the era of recycling refinement to the era of regeneration. And we now work in the Nature Prevails platform. And that is where I work closely with our third panel, our third speaker, Simon. Um, I'll give you a little bit of lay of the land of our uh, dialogue today. We're going to start out broad with the big picture. Why does it make good, solid business sense for corporations to be environmental stewards. And Stephanie Barger, who is the uh, USGBC, the United States Green Building Council Global Director of Market Transformation, will um, speak on that topic. Then we'll segue over to Tim Tresfer. I knew Tr Tim when he was the, worked closely with Tim when he was the Georgia World Congress Center's Director of Sustainability for 10 years. But now he um, is the Vice President of Sports and Venues for Honeycomb Strategies. And then we're going to, and he will talk on specifics, give specific examples of what um, he has accomplished um, in his corporate responsibilities over his um, 15, 20 year um, career in this area. And then we're going to shift gears to my friend and colleague, um, Simon Lamb. He is a renowned author and economist. He's the author of Junglenomics. And he's going to educate us on why sustainability is no longer feas feasible for us to thrive on this earth, that we must regenerate. And Simon will educate also on how you can use Junglenomics to work and revamp the commodities markets. So again, it makes good business sense for us to be stewards of our environment and to thrive. And now I'm going to turn over to Stephanie and I ask you to give a brief introduction of yourself, Stephanie. Great, thank you so much, Holly, and to the Temple of Understanding. Such a joy and an honor to be here. Um, just a brief history of myself, which kind of ties into also talking about businesses, is I actually was a CPA way back when, and Holly and I shared that career experience. 
And um, with that, I start helping nonprofits. And I was also in the real estate industry, both commercial and residential, and started helping nonprofits and volunteering. And then in the year 2000, I started a nonprofit for somebody else, but it became mine called Earth Resource Foundation. And we really focused on the community. And we were in Newport Beach, and so there's lots of plastic pollution. So we focused on that. We had um, high school clubs, which were amazing and really inspiring leadership. It wasn't so much just about environmentalism, but leadership. And that led us to hosting zero waste business conferences for oh, almost 10 years. And from there, we designed the zero waste certification under the US Zero Waste Business Council. And then in 2016, we were acquired by the global nonprofit US Green Building Council and rebranded to True. And as Holly said, I work globally with companies and help them um, achieve their zero waste. So just once again, very excited to be here and hopefully um, share some knowledge and some tips for helping us all work together. Thanks, Stephanie. Great introduction. Um, from your perspective, what are the driving forces that motivate businesses to embrace environmental stewardship? Well, they are many and varied. I think at the beginning, um, a lot of it was actually regulation. So even just, you know, we used to dump hazardous waste into the ocean and rivers and streams. And so, and that regulation came from the community, came from advocacy, came from people speaking out. So a lot of it is consumer driven. It's what are uh, customers willing to buy and what do they buy and what do they give feedback. The other motivator is actually very selfish. Um, and this was brought to our attention by one of our great companies, Rico Electronics, because the more that they save valuable natural resources, um, the better the market is for, for those, those commodities and those resources. And also, if, if companies poison all of their customers, um, they're going to go out of business, right? So uh, those are some of it. And then moving forward um, to today, we have a lot of um, financial regulation. Um, in the, the stock exchange, there's, there's regulations, there's a whole thing on greenwashing and making sure that you're not greenwashing your um, um, things that you're saying about your company. We now have ESG. So there's a lot of motivating there. And then another thing that I'm really excited about is because zero waste and green is up front and climate change is up front, there's a lot of friendly competition between companies to see who can be the greenest. And we'll talk more about, you know, how do we make sure that they're really doing that? And then I think also, you know, climate change is all around us and, and companies need to be resilient. So how are they gonna be resilient from the weather, from, from loss of natural resources, um, from markets, you know? So being green is also about being financially sustainable. Great. And I'd just like to add in there from my time working closely with you on the zero waste zones, we found that a lot of companies, when they started embracing zero waste practices, they improved their bottom line. And it also, additionally, there was a lot of, and I know this from Rico too, that when they, a lot of employee um, benefits, the employees got very excited about their zero waste practices. So I wanted to add that in there. Well, Stephanie, is there an industry that stands out for environmental stewardship above others? What qualities are common in leaders who embrace environmental stewardship? So I think the, the big companies we see it in is number one, companies out of Japan, because they have and have had um, very strict zero waste to landfill. So when we hear zero waste to landfill, that actually came out of Japan, they're an island. And so they're very limited, but it, it isn't just zero waste to landfill there. It's zero waste to um, incineration and then zero waste to mining. So sometimes people forget that. So companies like Toyota, like Rico, like um, Honda, 
they already are practicing zero waste to landfill and moving forward. So they've really been a lot of the leaders for that. Also, I think, you know, the green companies. So we have Method, which is a cleaning company, Earth Friendly Products or Ecos. Um, and that's because the essence of their product is green and is helping to save the environment. And more importantly, helping to save our health. Um, and then we have wonderful, there's lots of wonderful clothing companies that are being very innovative. So Rothy's, which makes shoes, they um, 3D image their shoes. So they're not made on a regular manufacturing and losing all the excess scrap. The shoes are made individually um, through 3D printing. So there isn't any leftover scrap from that. And they also have made their, their shoes so they can be completely circular. And then I will say a lot of our beverage companies, adult beverage companies, like Sierra Nevada Brewing Company, uh, they were one of our leaders. And they really are so innovative, not only where they're getting their product from, their hops and growing organically, but what they do with everything after that. And then we have so many farms, and, and that is really exciting, right? Because food is our essence. Um, and so to be able to have food um, farms that are growing not only organically, but not being wasteful and even being very concerned about what they're packaging our food in. So I think those are some of the leaders. And what do you find, what qualities do you find in the actual leadership, the CEOs um, in these um, environmental stewards as corporates? And then also, um, will you talk about the importance of corporate culture to environmental stewardship? Yes, and those definitely tie into each other. So I think there's there's two types of, of leaders. There's those that of their essence. Um, so like the, the owner of Sierra Nevada Brewing Company, he's been green from way back when. And so there's a lot of companies that they started from a very green part. And then there is the larger companies and that happens many different ways. And so like um, Anderson, uh, Ray Anderson, who, who has passed, but he's an icon and, and with his carpet company, um, what motivated him was actually a letter from an employee that basically said, what are we doing? We need to be more responsible with our product. And so Ray, I just think being the amazing leader uh, he was, he transformed not only his own company, but others. And I will say that that is, is one of the qualities of leaders is they're willing to share and bring people together. Um, and, and that goes into the culture. So if, if you want to transform your business, you have to train all of your employees. So we encourage companies to train their employees on environmental literacy, just like they train them on safety. Um, and just like you want zero accidents, zero customer complaints, zero product defects, you want zero waste. And in order to do that, it has to be all the time consistent. Um, it has to be an employee job description. And then you have to motivate employees and you have to understand them because not everybody cares about the sea turtle. You know, some employees care about the bottom line and if their company is going to be resilient, if they're going to get a raise. Some um, employees really care about their community. And so getting involved in the community um, and then about their children. So what are you doing um, with the product that you're producing and how is it produced. And I'll just close with this on, on corporate culture, um, that it's, it's very important um, not only to have the consistency, but to get it out there and, and let people know and empower not only your employees, but all of your stakeholders, your vendors, your suppliers, your downstream. You know, if you have a, um, on-site food service from an outside company or janitorial. What I love about janitorial is we now have green janitorial companies and they go to a whole nother level because they're managing materials. They're not managing waste. 
And so the janitorial companies are actually being our zero waste champions and experts. And it's just really amazing to empower those that sometimes get swept aside to really have ownership and, and knowledge to move things forward. For your closing, Stephanie, will you please give some examples of excellent corporate programs that are in place, both zero waste examples and beyond, and then also explain how they make good business sense. Sure, thank you. So our program, True Zero Waste, is really focuses on the operational um, every day. And we focus not on recycling and composting, but on reducing and reusing. And there are a lot of certifications out there for zero waste. And the power of that is when you reduce and reuse, you don't save thousands of dollars, you save billions of dollars, depending on the size of your company. And so I think what these zero waste certifications really do is they have standardization in how we're counting diversion. And once again, putting the emphasis up on top. So uh, we like to say ours is the most comprehensive, um, but there's other great programs. And then I will shift to LEED, which is our green building. But once again, there are many green building certifications out there. And they really deal with not only, of course, saving energy and water, but the materials that are put into these buildings, making sure they're circular, making sure they're non-toxic. And then I think where the industry is going is, is like our partner organization, WELL, which focuses on the health of your employees. What are you feeding them? Are you giving them an opportunity to exercise? What is the air quality in the building? Sometimes the air quality in our high rises that are, you know, don't have open windows and ventilation is very toxic compared to the outside. So I think, you know, there's a wide array of amazing certifications and it's important because it provides standardization and eliminates the greenwashing. So once again, thank you so much, Holly, for this opportunity. Thank you, Stephanie. And now let's go on to Tim Tresfer. And like I said, I worked with Tim closely from uh, his inception at the Georgia World Congress Center for, in his 10 year tenure there. And I'd like you, Tim, to introduce yourself, give a little bit more background, and then we'll dive into some specifics of um, it, corporate stewardship, environmental stewardship. Great. Thanks, Holly. Thank you um, to Stephanie and Simon as well, and Temple of Understanding for having us today. Um, I have been in the sustainability space for the duration of my career, um, which spans over 15 years now, um, really initiated uh, from an interest in the real estate industry, um, the built environment, learning from there about green buildings, lead certification that Stephanie just spoke to, um, and really uh, pursued my career within the green building space um, and was able to work with a number of different building types from schools to warehouses and office buildings, all the way to uh, convention centers, helping them go through the lead certification process, which is as Stephanie said, an internationally recognized green building rating system that really covers the gamut of new construction all the way through operations and maintenance of an existing building. Um, and as a result of doing that work for a few years, uh, I was uh, back in 2010, um, not many folks had sustainability experience, let alone sustainability and convention or hospitality experience. So the opportunity with the Georgia World Congress Center Authority became available and um, it was a perfect fit and great timing. Uh, that organization at the time owned and operated the, the convention center uh, in downtown Atlanta, along with the NFL stadium, Georgia Dome and Centennial Olympic Park. Uh, and uh, I was able to work with that organization for 10 plus years uh, on a variety of initiatives from lead certification to waste diversion to energy and water efficiency, uh, all the way to working with our different events that we hosted and um, helping them to minimize the environmental impacts of the events taking place in uh, on our campus 
during um, and and trying to leave a positive legacy while while being there at the same time. Um, and Holly, as you mentioned, I've, I'm now vice president of sports and venues for Honeycomb Strategies, which is a um, it's a women led B Corps uh, hospitality and sustainability consulting firm that specializes in the convention, sports, and live events industries. Uh, we work with a variety of clients from sports teams, sports venues, um, all the way to uh, large events, including Green Build, um, which I believe Stephanie put a link to in the chat, um, which is the US Green Building Council's uh, annual trade show one of the greenest events in the world, uh, all about green buildings and other green practices for organizations. But um, I, I've been fortunate to be a part of this industry since uh, its early stages, uh, at least in the hospitality world. And it's been just a phenomenal journey to see where we were and uh, where we've come to today. And I was honored to see Tim come on board as what I considered a youngster back then. And he created the position. He didn't come in and replace somebody. He created the position that segued him into the director of sustainability at the fourth largest convention center in the nation. And he also led it on being the world's largest lead certified convention center. And another thing that Tim always leaves out of his intro, and I always bring it in, is back in the day, um, both the Super Bowl and the Final Four came to Tim, as well as a colleague at the EPA, and asked Tim to um, develop the sustainability provisions of the Super Bowl and the Final Four um, RFPs. That's a really big deal. And so, Tim, I'd like you to talk about how did you become a leader in the sporting event industry standards? I do have to clarify, it wasn't the Super Bowl, it was just the Final Four that um, asked me for that. But yes, thank you for bringing that up. Um, so the sports industry, you know, obviously, I, I kind of stumbled into that uh, regard, having been involved in conventions and convention centers. Um, but the sports industry has just uh, become a major leader in the sustainable practices and I'd say one of the lead, one of the industry leaders uh, in the world, really, because if you think about it, all industries come together in the sports world, some in some form or fashion, whether they're sponsors, whether they're suppliers, whether they're fans, everybody comes together. And so I think the sporting industry was really pushed to become um, uh, to really focus on sustainability from an early stage because they're their key stakeholders were asking about it. You know, Stephanie mentioned Sierra Nevada and adult beverages, you know, those industries obviously meet on the sports field um, or in the venues where they play. And, um, you know, when they're asking their, their suppliers about what practices they're um, incorporating to be better stewards to the environment or to the community that they operate in, um, the sports industry has to react. Uh, especially because it's so competitive. I mean, not only on the field or on the court, but they're competitive in the nature of their business. And so to be leaders, they had to react and do uh, work quickly. So that's, you know, really it, it became, I think, timing wise, uh, was, I was really fortunate to be there at the right time. Um, but ultimately, that's the reason why the sports world has really taken a leadership role is there not only are there suppliers and their business stakeholders and asking for it, but now we're seeing employees asking for it, especially Gen Z and millennials. They're, they're really pushing their, um, their employers to focus on sustainability and diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, and other ESG issues because um, they care about it. And likewise, you have all these fans coming to a sporting event or to one of these iconic venues that they play in, and they want to know what you're doing too. Um, waste is, you know, the most tangible aspect of sustainability that a fan typically will interact with at an event. So prioritizing waste diversion or true zero waste certification is 
is essential because you're going to get criticized if you're not prioritizing that from a um, an average fan standpoint. You can, you know, have a very energy efficient building, but um, fans aren't going to necessarily notice or or think it's as sexy as composting. Uh, so I think that there's, you know, a lot of opportunity around having these certifications um, because as it's been said, they provide a standardization and they provide a level playing field for these teams and venues to really compare themselves to others, but also to show that there's transparency in the process and there's transparency in what they're doing. And um, third-party verification is always a good thing. And it's a great thing to avoid greenwashing in that sense as well. Well, Tim, you answered my next question. I like that within the, your thorough answer about what motivates the sports um, events, the teams, and the facilities. But talk to me, do you find any resistance? Um, is it all, let's go for this? Or do you find some resistance out there when you're dealing with these the teams and the um, venues? Um, you know, not as much. I don't find as much resistance anymore as I as I did 10 years ago, I'll tell you that. Um, there are, you know, different approaches that different events or teams or venues will take. And that's natural because everybody's got their own priorities and everybody has different opportunities to, to improve. But um, I think that, you know, everybody or, you know, most businesses recognize that this has become an imperative. Um, everybody's a, at a different place on their journey, um, but I think most businesses have recognized that this is a journey they need to be on, and they need to really um, incorporate that into their into their operations in some form or fashion. Otherwise, they're going to be left behind. And to be a sustainable business financially, you have to be able to, you know, justify what you're doing from an environmental and a social standpoint as well. Thanks again for a nice thorough answer. I appreciate it. Now let's go back to the GWCC, Georgia World Congress Center. Um, during your tenure there, you not only achieved Silver LEED certification, you upped it to the next to Gold LEED certification, which was highly impressive. Um, I'd like you to talk about what does that mean from an environmental standpoint? What did that mean from a business perspective? Did that give you all a stronger um, competitive advantage when you were bidding um, for different events? And then also, so I don't have to ask it later, if you'll talk about I just the, the energy system overhaul, if you'll give a nice overview of it, that was really impressive. Yeah, thank you. Um, so as I mentioned, you know, my background had been in green building consulting. So when I joined the World Congress Center Authority, that was one of my um, anticipated tasks was to take our buildings through the process of getting them lead for existing buildings certified. Again, this goes back to 2010 when lead was not new, but it was not heavily adopted in the hospitality industry yet at that point. And so it was a um, it was a really big deal for us to go through this process. And as you said, Holly, um, when we were able to officially achieve silver certification in 2014, we became the largest LEED certified convention center in the world. Um, the, the World Congress Center is uh, about 4 million square feet. So it's, uh, it was a major undertaking especially because the building not only is of that size, but it was developed over the course of four phases over the course of 30 plus years. So it was a lot of different systems integrated with each other, a lot of different practices that were put in place over the time of its existence. And so what we had to do was really utilize the rating system uh, for what it was and focus on how we could better improve our operations in, in five key areas, looking at our site. So obviously we couldn't move the building, but fortunately the building had been developed in a, a very urban location with um, two subway stops uh, adjacent to it to allow for alternative transportation, which really benefited us. Um, but we also looked at how are we dealing with landscaping? 
pest management. Um, from an actual interior standpoint, what type of water efficiency did we have as a building? Energy efficiency, renewable energy, type of chemicals were we using in our um, HVAC systems? Waste, waste diversion, so, um, and procurement. So what are you bringing into the building? What types of materials are they? And how are they leaving the building? Uh, along with um, indoor air quality. So, and we're seeing that even more important now after COVID and I apologize, uh, that's my dog barking. Um, we, indoor air quality is essential and that was actually our biggest hurdle going through the LEED certification process was um, bringing in enough outdoor fresh air. Not that the building wasn't bringing in fresh air, but when you imagine these large cavernous exhibit halls that convention centers um, have, GWCC had 13 of those massive exhibit halls. Um, for this particular certification, you're expected to bring in enough outdoor fresh air as if it were fully occupied, which, as you know, is a very rare occasion that an a, a entire convention center is completely fully occupied. So we did have to make adjustments, bring in more fresh air, but ultimately, um, you know, that was just another way for us to justify that the air quality inside the building is as um, clean as it could be. It also looked at our cleaning products. So what are we using within the building that could impact the air quality? Um, and ultimately, um, as I said, we were able to achieve LEED Silver certification. And then we renewed at the LEED Gold certification level in 2017. And that was almost solely due to an energy efficiency project that um, helped us to increase our efficiency. Uh, and we reduced our energy consumption by 40% um, within those three years due to a, um, an energy saving performance contract, which is a creative financing mechanism that allows us to, or allowed us to essentially change out every light bulb on our campus, 60,000 plus light bulbs to LEDs. Um, we built an entirely new central chiller plant to help heat and cool the entire um, World Congress Center and a number of other uh, energy efficiency uh, practices. But ultimately we were able to save 40% on our utilities, um, which we didn't have to finance. We did not have to pay any money up front. It was financed by a third party who, um, who gets paid in return by the savings that we see. So they're incentivized to help us save as much money as possible. And um, likewise, the World Congress Center was able to see a significant drop in energy usage, helped it to achieve lead gold status, um, and really just helped um, to elevate our status as a sustainable organization. Sorry, I couldn't get to my unmute. Um, thank you on that. And I was always so impressed that you were able to do that complete system overhaul without minimal out-of-pocket costs to the GWCC. Now that's impressive, but what I'd like you to address next, you could do that because you were such a large facility and you know, and you were also government owned and that. If you can just address quickly in your final question about what are things that some smaller privately held businesses can do that don't have that volume that you did at the GWCC? Yeah, I think, um, you know, looking at it from an energy perspective, um, there are creative ways that you can incorporate renewable energy into your portfolio without having to even um, put much money down to, to do so. Uh, power purchase agreements have become a really regular and common practice in this country. And we see that happening a lot as a way to have a third party fund renewable energy on a, on a facility and be able to um, allow that facility to use that renewable energy without having to have paid for the actual solar array or windmills, whatever it may be. Um, and then looking at it from another perspective, you know, Stephanie talked um, primarily about waste diversion. Um, I think that's a low hanging fruit where you can easily 
save money operationally or uh, monetize your waste stream. Um, waste isn't waste until it's wasted. So you can really take those materials, they are materials truly, and sell them, commoditize them. Holly, you and I did a number of projects where we looked at you know, aluminum baling and selling that aluminum or baling plastic water bottles and selling that material. You know, if you put a concerted effort toward how you manage your waste stream, you can truly save money and monetize it and make money out of it. Thank you, Tim. And one thing I'd like to add in for the small business owners out there, if you go to your local government, um, there's a lot of programs that they have. And if they don't have them, you can use your power of consumer demand to help them get those. And whether they're in waste diversion or energy or other areas. So it, there are avenues for the smaller businesses to also be exceptionally proactive and make a difference. And now... It is time to shift gears to Simon Lamb. And back in 2017, I wrote an article and it took me in new directions. It was called Beyond Sustainability, Regenerative Solutions. And it also, what it introduced to me, and it was um, pretty eye-opening, was that sustainability isn't cutting it. We have done so much damage to our resources, to our environment and depletion, that if we just stay on this uh, track of sustainability, we're in trouble. So we must shift to regeneration. That's when EI ended our era of recycling refinement and started the era of regeneration. And my friend and colleague, um, Simon Lamb, who is the author of Jungle-nomics, is going to talk more in depth about that scenario. And then also, I'm very impressed with um, solutions that he's come up with. So Simon, if you could start out with an introduction of yourself. Hello, yes, Holly, thank you very much. And, and, and thank you, uh, Susie and Alison and, uh, and Tim and Stephanie. Um, I've learned a great deal from Tim and Stephanie just now that I, I didn't know about them. And I think it's just really intriguing the work they're doing and I commend them very highly for it. Um, my work is of a completely different nature. It's more, it's an academic approach to uh, how you approach, how you find uh, economic solutions to environment problems. Um, I started off uh, becoming extremely concerned about the environment a long time ago, but uh, over the years I began to think and write about it much more, and I eventually produced a book called Jungleonomics, as uh, Holly's already said, and that book um, encapsulates everything that I had been studying for the, for the previous 25 years or so. And uh, I have since doing this, since, since uh, publishing that book and since um, stepping onto the stage a bit, I've become a commission member, as elected commission member of the IUCN uh, CEAST, which is the uh, Commission for Environment, uh, Economics and Social Policy. And it's important. And, and one of the things that really interested me about that was that it included social policy. Um, the economics and environment are really important, but social policy that, to go with it is equally important. Um, and so I'm CEO of a business. So essentially, I've spent all these years, years being a businessman and a great deal of my spare time until, the, as my wife will tell you, the early hours of the morning, working and writing and thinking and reading about this this subject on a global scale. Thank you, Simon. And what what first got you into the environment? And you're an economist also. So what was what were your motivating factors that got you into this? And I'm going to combine the next two um, questions. So what 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 got you into this? And then why why did jungle nomics just why did you need to write it? Because I know it was a need. Well, I, I, I got into it in, in uh, originally in the era of uh, Thor Heyerdahl and, and Jacques Cousteau, who were the first people really seriously with a platform to uh, report on the environment. But also Rachel Carson's uh, famous book, uh, Silent Spring, was a real eye-opener in those days. And at the same time, I was really interested in, in evolution and economics. And they sound like disparate subjects. 
but in, in fact, I came to see that they are very closely related. Um, I, I suppose what first kicked me off was when I used to um, try to protect ancient woodlands in an area I, I lived because my wife and I uh, lived for a while in, in a very beautiful part of the country in North Wales. And in my conversations with, with people who were trying to, who were intending to um, cut down ancient oak woodland was that I saw in an ancient woodland, I, I saw the beauty and bounty of nature. I saw wildflowers and, and fungi, insects and birds, um, and these magnificent trees. Um, for me, it, it was a place of reverence, a place of joy. Um, but the people I was speaking to, I had seen in Kenny saw only lumber. That's all they saw in there. They, they measured the trees with their tape measures. And it was shocking to me that, that they were prepared to overlook that. And, and to extract that timber and destroy the woodland. We're talking not crop woodland here, we're talking about ancient woodland and, and sell it for profit. Uh, and I came to realize that, well, I, I remember reading um, the famous geologist Jakob von Uxo um, used to speak about umwelt. And an umwelt is, is a self world. So in the world of economics, everybody sees in the, in, in the animal world, Every creature sees the world in a different way according to its own priorities and its own need to acquire resources. And it's exactly the same in the economics world. People see objects in the way they need to in order to be successful in that world. So when you start to develop that thought, you start to realize that, that um, it's all about market demand. It's, it's, it's all, we are species in an economic ecosystem. And market demand is what drives us to try to acquire the commodities that are out there in order to, in order to make a profit, feed our families, keep our businesses going. So we're constantly seeking profitable resources, um, following on at the same time as, 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 as the environment was becoming a hot issue in the 1970s and 80s. Um, there was an organization we all heard of called, called Greenpeace and a great deal of protest, but awareness and, and pressure was always going to be a good thing, but nothing I could see was ever going to change until you address the core problems. And that's the economic valuation of nature. Until you reevaluate and revalue nature in markets and particularly in commodity markets, such as uh, uh, timber and food markets, but, but, but also in, in, in metals and, uh, and rare earths and so on, you find that um, uh, you never really get to the bottom of the problem. Um, in the early 2000s, the world was really beginning to wake up to this uh, steep decline, in fact, an ongoing disaster. But, but I was completely frustrated by at least three decades because the, the first mega uh, summit was Stockholm in 1972 on environment. And then there was Rio and New York and then Johannesburg uh, 30 years later. And some of the greatest minds of the world meeting and to discuss this. And yet there was never any improvement. If you looked at the rainforest destruction, if you looked at uh, ocean degradation, um, anywhere you looked, land degradation, it, it was a steep downhill slope still. So for me, who felt that I really understood what was going on and why it was going on and what the, the, the power behind it was, um, I really felt I needed to put that in writing and, uh, and to explain how if we approach uh, our economics from a different perspective in order to give commodities, uh, to interfere in commodity markets to make valuable natural things, more valuable standing than fell, more that valuable intact than extracted. And the same goes with, with pollution and other environment degradation. Unless you change the economics of the situation, you're always going to, how many regulations you put in, you're always going to get degradation. So we saw biodiversity continuing to plummet, we saw CO2 continuing to rise as we do now and uh, soaring pollution. And I really wanted to explain that um, it was a classic natural phenomenon that we were seeing. It's not, not about 
human greed. It's about a natural phenomenon of, of the, ex the acquisition and exploitation of resources. Once you understand that, you can start to look for pragmatic, uh, hopefully effective policy. Um, and that's what the book explores. It applies these principles to changing markets, um, basing, basing on, on natural principles rather than on trial and error. Thank you for that explanation. And I'd like you to delve a little bit deeper. You and I have had a lot of discussions about the markets and how the commodity market, you've touched on it, but if you could talk a little bit more about the um, challenges with the commodity markets and very briefly what your solution, your plan is. Well, the, the book contains um, plans and, and, and prospective solutions for uh, uh, virtually every area you can think of. But uh, I focus because it's something that, that is uh, of enormous importance in so many aspects. Um, environmentally, economically, and socially on, on rainforests and other what I call high conservation value areas. Um, and in order to, if, if you think of it as a, a marketplace as being an ecosystem, when you have a powerful beast like, uh, like the, the, the big pulp mills and the loggers and, and, the, and the farmers who are stripping out rainforests in order to plant soy and, and so on, um, you realize that the only way you can actually overcome that is to put a bigger beast in, in their place. And that bigger beast happens to be there. It, there is extraordinary how much money is overhanging green investment markets and investment managers who are looking for good, solid investments. So that, on that particular subject, I devised something called environmental services investment bonds. And those are initially, essentially, to cut a long story short, they, they are in order to, the, the investment version of them is for sovereign owned land, and it essentially provides large sums for them uh, for, for countries and nations with sovereign owned land, and in order, in return, for receiving trust uh, controlled money, which goes towards really important things like their green development, but also health and education, which are constantly left out because they're so deeply in debt. Um, so, so social development as, as well as green economic development. Um, and in, the, in return, they lock up um, large areas of pristine, uh, in this case, rainforests. Um, so there's a deal to be done there. And what that is doing is, is, is saying to governments, you don't let any more farmers cut this down. Don't let any more loggers because this is this is uh, your family's silver. You can you can cash in on this ad infinitum, uh, really, uh, in return for interest-free capital, providing you spend that capital in these specific ways. Then you talk rightly about regeneration and regeneration. We've 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 gone too far. The decline is too great. I mean, one of the reasons I joined the IUCN, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, is because they publish every year a red list of threatened species, and there are more and more to add to that, and more and more that are on the brink of uh, of extinction with every passing year. And despite the wonderful work that that people like Tim and Stephanie are doing on that stage. In the commodity market stage, on, on, on in the vast rainforests of Africa and South America, uh, that is not happening, and things need to change. Thank you, Simon. And what I'd also like to tell everyone is not only is Simon here um, as a featured speaker on this dialogue, he is also a featured speaker and um, an interview, a 36 minute interview. It's absolutely superb. And I'm confident that the Temple of Understanding will share that link with you if they haven't already done so. So now it is time to shift into our Q&A. And I'd like to go to each panelist, and I'll start with Stephanie, is, you know, what can we as individuals do? Talk about how do we use our power of consumer <laughs> demand, our proactiveness, so we can make a difference and how we can influence the decisions that businesses make. Stephanie? Sure. So I think, first of all, you know, the old adage uh, is act, think globally, act locally. 
So we all work for businesses or our partners work for businesses. So start there, start with your own business, start with, um, you know, uh, getting them to zero waste, getting them to understand what they're doing. And then I think it's very important um, that we are positive with companies. There are plenty of, of organizations that are out there, you know, beating the drumbeat and get involved in them. And, and you know, you can climb walls or do a protest and do all of that. But I think really it's about, you know, if it's a restaurant, not just filling out a form or giving them a bad Yelp review, but actually sitting down and talking to the manager and understanding their struggles. Because with most businesses, they're focused on their business. So you have to let them know that this is a positive way for them to be sustainable. But there are, there's a great organization called Habits About Waste, and they did this positive campaign with Uber Eats and DoorDash um, and we're able to convince them on the apps that people had to opt in if they wanted disposable silverware and condiments and everything like that. So those are simple actions that you can take. And then most importantly, um, you are what you buy, right? And so don't be buying from those other companies. I, I am, you know, Amazon is great in some ways and it's not to, to single out Amazon. But I have a lot of very environmentally minded people, but they shop online and they, they get all this packaging. Why aren't you going to your farmer's market? Why aren't you supporting small local businesses and, and doing that? So we have to look at our own habits first before we go to the businesses. And then just in closing, we have tons of resources for businesses. Um, so, you know, reach out to us and we're here to help and support. Yeah, and I'll just add on to Stephanie's is use your dollar spendings as your vote. But there, Tim, let's go to you. I was going to say vote with your wallet. So <laughs> I think we're um, all on the same page. One other additional comment I'll make on this is, um, you know, Stephanie mentioned greenwashing, which I think has become so pervasive now that everybody is very aware of how and what they're reporting, everybody being the businesses knowing that greenwashing is a very um, real issue that they need to avoid. But likewise, businesses are now um, green hushing, which is the new term where they're not reporting sustainability practices or reporting their, their own environmental business practices because they're afraid of getting called out or they're afraid of people you know, pointing fingers at them for not doing enough. So I I guess I'd say, you know, celebrate what you can, you know, businesses aren't perfect, um, but a lot of them are trying and, um, you know, really, I think recognizing that they're trying um, is one really encouraging way for them to want to continue to do more. I agree, you know, just if you're in a store, in a restaurant, in some place, and they're doing things right, go find the manager tell them. So you're not complaining. You're saying something really positive and empowering to them. Simon. Unmute. Even though I've been talking about large scale things, there are a lot of small scale things that people can do. I mean, from if, if you can afford it, although they pay themselves back, you can put solar panels uh, on your roof or wherever you can manage to do so. You can buy a just a handful of stock shares in one of the big oil majors, for example. It gives you a vote on the board. And in fact, there, there, there is a, an organization that will uh, you can sign your vote over to. And they use your vote to try and turn these beer moths around to get them to invest more in, alternative, in, in renewable energy. So yes, there are, there are quite a few things to do in addition to the ones that, that, that Stephanie and Tim have already said. Thank you. Um, Tim, you had a question for Simon. I did, yes. Um, Simon, I was wondering if you could share with us kind of the role that government plays in what you've been discussing and if and how they are meeting those expectations or challenges. Thank you for that question, Tim. I, I, 
government are central, actually. Uh, they are absolutely central to it because it is they who set the terms of business. It's they who allow uh, commodities to cross their borders. In the case of environmental services bonds, um, it, it, it requires governments to provide the coupon, the income, to go with these bonds so that they are interest-free. Uh, governments, there are 39 governments that have offered uh, 100 billion a year through the Green Climate Fund for just such projects. So far, they've I think about 20 billion has been produced, and there's a little bit more that's been produced on a, on a loan basis, not what was intended at all. So governments really need to step up, and I think for all of efforts that we as individuals and the small companies can make, in the end, we're in a hiding to not nothing, but to a lot less than if we have government support. Sorry, Holly, you were on mute. I couldn't hear you. You're Dan, mute, you have a question for Stephanie. Yes, I do. Um, <laughs> Stephanie, so, you know, True Zero Waste and the U.S. Green Building Council have definitely been leaders in the certification space now for quite a long time. I'm curious, now that they're established, where do you go from here? Like, how do you continue to raise the bar and, and what's next for the organization? Great. Thanks, Tim. So I think, first of all, um, you know, we are on lead version five now. So every couple of years or every five years for our green building certification, we're taking it to the next level. And we get input from all of our stakeholders of where we can go. And then secondly, they've added all these different certifications. So now we have true, we have our zero waste. We have our healthy buildings uh, for healthy communities. We have our lead for cities. Um, we have sustainable sites. So that's the outdoor spaces. <clears throat> but I think more importantly, especially with our new CEO, Peter Templeton, our goal is to lift everybody up. So it's not about everybody getting certified, but giving all buildings, all communities, the tools they need to just take those couple of steps forward. And I will say, you know, we are a nonprofit, so we do incredible work on working with the government to get, you know, correct legislation. But also we have our Center for Green Schools. We work with the faith, the interfaith community. We work with underprivileged communities and, and countries. So I think that's really our new frontier is to lift everybody up. Thank you. That was a great answer. And I want to thank everyone, our, our speakers, uh, Stephanie Barger, Tim Tresfer, and Simon Lamb for an absolutely excellent dialogue today on environmental stewardship, the business perspective, and EI was highly, highly honored to orchestrate and moderate. And with that, I'd like to turn back over to the Temple of Understanding to Allison. Thank you all so much. Um, I'm trying to get in here. There we go, okay. My computer is doing strange things today. I don't know what's going on, okay. Thank you all so much. This has been really fascinating. And I just, I think we're, this is just the tip of the iceberg on this subject. I mean, there is so much to explore here. So um, I, I just really want to say that you have opened our eyes a great deal to, um, to the business perspective, which, which we need to pursue. And I, I especially would like to, um, you know, pursue more examples of like, you know, really on a practical level, how do we approach CEOs, for instance, who are, you know, involved in extractive practices that are for, oh, let's say, you know, electric cars or something like that. But at the same time, they're destroying an indigenous communities, livelihood and um, in future. So, I mean, there are all sorts of things that I can sort of see as, wow, we can really go, we can take this one again and again. So just want to thank all of you so much. And I also want to thank those of you that have participated in this program today, especially those that have given us some funding for the important projects that we are continuing to do with our dialogues. Next, in June, we are going to be working with our youth. We have a youth program. We have uh, about 18, 20, 18 to 20, 20 to 22 year olds come 
to the United Nations for all kinds of interactions. Um, the program is not held at the UN, it's not part of the UN, but we bring these young people who are interested in um, foreign affairs and, and issues that are part of the UN work to study and explore their own interests, their own perspective, they, they have projects and whatnot. So one of the things we've done is we've included our dialogue process for young people. So our program coming up in June is uh, on youth voices on the climate from religious and spiritual perspectives, which is, is young people who come out of a Christian, Hindu, Jewish, and possibly a Muslim background, speaking to these um, 18 young people and inspiring them to do more in terms of environmental work. So thank you all. This has been a wonderful, wonderful event, and I hope to to work with all of you more in the future. Music